Hi guys, I'm Sonali and I'm an interventional cardiologist from India. I started this YouTube channel to teach whatever little I've learned in the field of cardiology so far. So this channel is called Cardiology and Beyond. And the reason I, I speak specifically of and beyond is because I want to go beyond the foundations, that is go beyond the basics and sort of try to tie in the foundation with what we see in real clinical practice. I'll also be stressing upon understanding a lot of underlying cardiology concepts and the approach to this learning series will be based heavily on active learning. So what is active learning? I'll talk about that subsequently. Right, so today I'll be talking about ejection sounds or ejection clicks. This falls under the broad topic of clinical questions or clinical cardiology. You may wonder, why did I begin with ejection sounds? Well, I just happened to see a patient recently who had some wonderful ejection clicks, both from the pulmonary and aortic valves. And I thought, why not? Let's just dive in and get into this topic. So my approach to learning anything new or trying to understand something new is to always mind map about where this particular topic would lie. It's almost similar to the maps that you see in various malls, wherein they show you, you are here, and then they show all the shops which are spread all over the mall, and you come to know where you are and where you ought to be or where you would like to go to. So similarly, I have mapped out today's topic so that you know exactly where you are and what you're going to be learning about. So today we'll be learning about clinical examination under which where we'll be talking about auscultation and a very specific small part of auscultation called ejection clicks or ejection sounds. Now, it's not a very commonly discussed topic. I could have easily gone to S1, S2, S3, one of the more important heart sounds. But since this particular sound caught my fancy because of a case that I saw recently, I thought, why not? Let's just jump into it. And trust me, it's going to be a lot of fun. So on further mind mapping, you will see that I have come up with around 30 odd questions under the topic of ejection click. This is something which I found profoundly important uh, in terms of learning something new. And this is known as active learning. There are a lot of videos on YouTube which explain active learning in detail. But if I've got to describe it in a nutshell, what it means is you have to keep testing yourself. So whether you're learning new material or if or whether you're revising something which you've already read in the past, you have to just keep asking questions. That makes it an active process that gives some chance to your brain to try and work out the answer. And even if you're wrong, it's fine. It gives you that opportunity that it gives your brain that opportunity to work out the answer in such a way that you will remember the concept or you will remember the ideas the next time when you're asked to recall it. All right. So what I would suggest is to take a screenshot of this particular image and to try and answer these questions first before we go further into the topic. So let's begin. The first question is, what does the presence of ejection sounds denote? All right. So what does it mean? So when you say ejection sounds, it basically means that it's a systolic phenomenon because ejection of blood always occurs in systole. So what it denotes is that the systolic murmur, if it is associated with the murmur, then that murmur is truly organic. And what does that mean is that this murmur is not because of increased flow across a normal valve, which is known as flow murmur or a functional murmur. But in fact, the murmur is because of a diseased valve. So for example, if there is pulmonary stenosis and you have a pulmonary ejection click, then the ejection systolic murmur that is heard because of the pulmonary stenosis is because of the diseased valve and not because of increased flow across that pulmonary valve. So in a sense, when you hear ejection sounds, it means that there is an underlying cardiovascular disease. So what are the two mechanisms of ejection sounds or an ejection click? Now, ejection clicks can be either of valvar level, that is because of a stenosis at any one of the semilunar valves, or 
it can be because of a vascular component that is either one of the two great arteries that is aorta or pulmonary artery so let's see how valvular stenosis leads to an ejection sound so essentially this is the semilunar valve either the aortic or the pulmonary valve in diastole and this is a thickened stenotic doming pulmonary or aortic valve which is trying to open in early ejection or early systole so when there is a doming of this valve there is a abrupt halting of a doming valve at the early systole or at the onset of ejection because it's unable to open completely as a result this blood jet which is denoted by these arrows decelerates against this doming valve so this hitting of the blood jet or the deceleration of the blood jet against this thickened diseased doming stenotic valve leads to the produ production of an ejection sound so this is the reason of a valvular click now we come to a vascular click these are produced by sound transients due to sudden tensing or reverberation of the proximal aorta or pulmonary artery why is this important is because these uh, great vessels that is the aorta or the pulmonary artery are not normal they are diseased they have raised systolic pressure and their compliance is reduced that means they are pretty stiff sometimes aneurysmal arteries right so here we see the diastole in which the semilunar valves are closed aorta or pulmonary and in systole you can see that this valve is not diseased the valve is normal however the proximal artery either the aorta or the pulmonary artery is not normal it may either be very hypertensive as in systemic hypertension or pulmonary hypertension or it may be aneurysmal or in general it is a stiff vessel so here you can see the blood jet which decelerates against the wall of this great artery and this hitting of the blood jet against these hypertensive walls or stiff walls leads to the mechanism of an ejection sound so what happens to the ejection sound when valvular stenosis is very severe now essentially when the valve cusps become relatively immobile or they become calcific then the ejection sound as well as the corresponding second heart sound that is a2 in case of aortic stenosis which becomes severe or p2 in case of severe pulmonary stenosis becomes diminished or absent so what it means is when you have a loud ejection click it means that the leaflets are mobile now here's an example of three severities of pulmonary stenosis in the first example you can see that this is s1 this is the ejection click and it is kicking off a short ejection systolic murmur this murmur stops well before the second heart sound and both the heart sounds are heard p2 is not diminished this is the mild variety of pulmonary stenosis in the moderate variety of pulmonary stenosis you'll see that the distance between s1 and ejection click is now decreased as compared to that of the mild that means that the ejection click is now coming closer and closer to s1 the ejection systolic murmur is now longer it peaks much later as compared to the mild variety and then you will notice that the p2 is now softer or it is diminished in its intensity in severe pulmonary stenosis you will see that the ejection click has now merged with the first heart sound and you can no longer differentiate s1 and the ejection click so all that you hear is a single heart sound and it is taken to be as the first heart sound the ejection systolic murmur is now much longer and it peaks much later than before and then the a2 sound is heard and here you can see that the p2 is almost either absent or it is so soft that you will not be able to hear an aortic ejection sound or click is heard most commonly in which condition now by far the most common association of an aortic ejection sound is the bicuspid aortic valve in children 
It presents as congenital aortic stenosis and it leads to doming of the aortic valve and as we've already seen a doming and a thickened aortic valve leads to the deceleration of the blood jet against it giving rise to this high frequency ejection sound now can a bicuspid aortic valve lead to an aortic ejection sound even if there is no aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation the answer is yes even without any AS or AR, the bicuspid valve by itself can also give rise to an ejection sound. The cusps are unequal. They have to share unequal forces because the cusps are two in number and not three, which is normally seen. And that gives rise to an eccentric jet of blood, which can decelerate against its own abnormal bicuspid valve. Or sometimes this eccentric jet decelerates against the proximal aorta beyond the valve giving rise to this aortic ejection click now another less common cause of an aortic ejection sound is the sound which is produced from a truncus arteriosus uh, usually the congenital valve of the truncus arteriosus can be either quadricuspid or tricuspid but when it is quadricuspid then again there is unequal distribution of forces across this valve and that gives rise to an eccentric jet again giving rise to an ejection sound the next important question is do acquired causes of aortic stenosis like a rheumatic aortic stenosis or a degenerative aortic stenosis give rise to an ejection sound and the answer is that it is very rare that is because by pathophysiology there is an extensive anatomic deformity calcification and excessive rigidity of the leaflets in these conditions and hence the production of an ejection sound is not heard the question is what does the presence of a pulmonary ejection sound denote so when you have a presence of a right ventricular outflow tract obstruction and you are sure that there is an obstruction but you're not able to tell clinically where the obstruction might be then when you do hear an ejection sound then it is very easy to localize the obstruction to the valvular level so it is no longer an infundibular level stenosis it's not a supravalvar level stenosis it is a valvar level stenosis and this holds true even on the left side that is when you have the presence of a aortic ejection sound and if you are suspecting a left ventricular outflow tract obstruction then the level of obstruction is denoted to be valvular when you hear an aortic ejection click so here's an example of an echocardiogram picture which shows both the aortic as well as the pulmonary valve so this is the aortic valve and this is the pulmonary valve and actually this is the tricuspid valve but our focus today is on these two valves now the aortic valve if you notice in the phase of systole that is when it opens it is made up of just two cusps so it is essentially a bicuspid aortic valve and this is an example of a patient who presented with two kinds of ejection clicks in the same person that is because this bicuspid aortic valve gave rise to a constant ejection click which was heard loudly at the apex it did not vary with the phases of respiration hence it was a constant ejection click on the other hand this is the pulmonary valve of the patient and you can notice that it is doming in systole so this doming of the pulmonary valve is giving rise to another ejection click which is the pulmonary ejection click and this particular click varies with respiration this particular click was heard better at the base of the heart and not at the apex and it varied with inspiration and expiration it being louder in expiration than in inspiration which is a peculiarity of an ejection click so after having watched the echocardiogram in the last slide, I'll now be talking about 
the most important aspect of a pulmonary ejection sound or a click which differentiates it from an aortic ejection sound and also differentiates it from a vascular origin of an ejection sound. So the question is, what is the most characteristic feature of a pulmonary ejection sound? And the answer is that there is a marked variability with respiration. So basically what happens is, with inspiration, this ejection sound softens or disappears. And this is an anomaly because usually all the right-sided events increase in intensity on inspiration. The only exception to this rule is a pulmonary ejection sound which softens or disappears with inspiration and becomes louder with expiration. What is the mechanism of this inspiratory decrease in the pulmonary ejection sound or a click? So normally, the pulmonary artery diastolic pressure is low in pulmonary stenosis. And the right ventricular end diastolic pressure is increased. That means that the right ventricular hypertrophy in response to this pulmonary stenosis is significant, which leads to a decrease in the compliance of the right ventricle. So in a sense, right ventricle is suffering from a kind of a diastolic dysfunction. And as a result, there is increase in the right ventricular end diastolic pressure. This does not mean that the RV systolic function is impaired. It may very well be normal, but the diastolic function of this right ventricle is definitely impaired, which leads to a decreased compliance and it finally leads to an increased end diastolic pressure. Now, this end diastolic pressure may be normal at rest, but then it changes on inspiration. So what happens with inspiration is that there is an increase in venous flow as we know that the intrathoracic pressure becomes more negative which sucks in blood from the rest of the body from the lower limbs and it, it leads to increased venous flow. Increased flow in the right atrium leads to a more forceful right atrial contraction. So this inspiration triggers off a rise in the right ventricular end diastolic pressure because this right ventricle, which is hypertrophied, whose compliance is very less, is not able to handle this increase in venous return, which occurs on inspiration. As, as a result, the right ventricular end diastolic pressure starts rising and it becomes greater than the normal pulmonary artery diastolic pressure. So remember, these are all diastolic events. So the RV diastolic pressure becomes greater than the pulmonary artery diastolic pressure. So what this means is, it's like somebody trying to push against the door of a room. So the cusps are pushed towards the open position in late diastole. Remember, the cusps are supposed to open in systole. But because of this rise in RV end diastolic pressure, the pulmonary valvular cusps start getting pushed open in the late diastole itself. There's a pressure gradient between the RV and the pulmonary artery in this late diastole. So what happens next? The next event is systole in which the cusps are already towards the open position. So the opening excursion of these pulmonary valvular cusps is quite minimal. So you do not get a sudden deceleration of the blood jet against the valve, which we normally ex would expect uh, to see in a doming pulmonary valve. So in inspiration, the opening excursion is limited and you do not get the sudden click of the, of the early ejection phase and hence, you get either a soft ejection sound or sometimes you may not get an ejection click at all. On the other hand, when there is expiration, this rise in RVDP does not occur. And so the cusps normally open in systole with a sudden jerk. And there is therefore a sudden deceleration of the blood jet against the wall, which we know now is the mechanism towards the production of an ejection sound. 
This is again to talk about the same concept that we just spoke about. And the question here is what happens normally to the right ventricular end diastolic pressure on inspiration without the presence of pulmonary stenosis? So in you and me, what happens? When we inspire, the pulmonary artery diastolic pressure falls. Similarly, the right ventricular end diastolic pressure either falls or it remains unchanged. It may fall because of direct transmission of the negative intrathoracic or intraprural pressure in the right ventricle. So essentially, in normal people, both pulmonary artery diastolic pressure as well as right ventricular end diastolic pressure both fall. However, in cases of pulmonary stenosis, the pulmonary artery diastolic pressure does fall but the right ventricular end diastolic pressure rises as we talked about earlier mainly because of the presence of rvh or even if rvh may not be present in cases of mild or moderate pulmonary stenosis the right ventricular compliance has started decreasing at a microvascular level at a microstructural le uh, level rather and as a result the pressure rises because the stiffness of the ventricle is unable to deal with the extra blood which comes in the RV during the phase of inspiration. This next concept is important to differentiate the behavior of the pulmonary stenosis murmur and the pulmonary stenosis ejection sound or click in response to changes in respiration. So the pulmonary stenosis murmur is an ejection systolic murmur. And what happens is on inspiration, there is an increase in the venous return. As a result, there is increased blood volume passing through the stenosed pulmonary valve. When there's an excessive volume or excessive flow of blood across this fixed obstruction of pulmonary stenosis, there is accentuation of the ejection systolic murmur. That is, the ejection systolic murmur increases in its intensity. And this is what we see. This is an inspiratory phase and this is an expiratory phase. This is systole. This is S1, which is not labeled here. This is the systolic ejection murmur or the ejection systolic murmur which is seen it is kite shaped crescendo decrescendo shape of this ejection systolic murmur this is a preserved a2 sound because the aortic valve is normal and the p2 is softer with respect to a2 because this particular heart valve the pulmonary valve is diseased so it is softer as you can see in this phase of inspiration you cannot make out any presence of an ejection sound or an ejection click now during expiration the ejection sound is heard and we know the reason why by now but the murmur itself becomes soft with respect to the murmur that you get in inspiration so this is the basic differentiation all the right-sided events, including the ejection systolic murmur, increase in intensity on inspiration, except for the ejection systolic click, which decreases or disappears on inspiration. Now that we're done with the basic concept of the right-sided ejection clicks, mainly the valvar cause of right-sided ejection click, which is valva pulmonary stenosis leading to an ejection sound let's deal with something on the left side so the question is what conditions are associated with an aortic root ejection sounds or clicks now the left-sided ejection clicks can again arise either from a valve or from the aorta the question is asking about the aortic root so essentially what are the various causes Number one is aortic aneurysm. The degree, the jet angle at which the blood jet hits against this aortic aneurysmal wall is almost 90 degrees. So you can imagine the kind of click it produces. Similarly, systemic hypertension because of the inherently increased pressure within the aorta le leads to 
excessive stiffness of the walls of the aorta and that again is responsible for the production of an ejection sound. There are certain conditions which lead to increased flow across a seemingly normal aorta. So what are they? Number one, if there is aortic regurgitation because of the diseased aortic valves, which during systole leads to excessive flow against the aortic wall in, in, in the latter part of systole. High output states like anemia or thyrotoxicosis can also lead to excessive flow across the aortic valve and into the aorta. And also in cases of severe tetralogy of fallow, for example, uh, tetralogy of fallow, which is associated with pulmonary atresia, most or all of the output rather goes through the aorta and the aorta in such a case is quite dilated. And as a result, because of this increased flow, the jet hits, hits against the aortic wall and leads to the production of an ejection sound or a click. Coming back to the right side of the heart, the question is, what are the non-valvular causes of pulmonary ejection sound or click? Now, the most common valvular cause is obviously valvular pulmonary stenosis. So apart from that, the non-valvular causes will center on all causes involving the pulmonary artery. Just like on the left side, all the non-valvular causes are because of diseases of the aorta. The most common cause is pulmonary hypertension. And to be noted, pulmonary hypertension leads to a constant ejection sound or a click. It is not variable with respiration as what is seen with valvular pulmonary stenosis. Pulmonary hypertension leads to a very stiff pulmonary artery and the sudden hitting of the blood jet against the pulmonary artery leads to the production of this ejection sound. The second most common cause or oft repeated, uh, oft mentioned cause is idiopathic dilatation of the pulmonary artery. Again, the same patho pathogenesis is deceleration of blood jet against the pulmonary artery wall leads to a click. As was seen on the left side, again, again, all the causes of increased flow across a seemingly normal pulmonary valve can also give rise to a pulmonary ejection sound. For example, hyperkinetic states like anemia, thyrotoxicosis, and also left to right shunts. What does the presence of ejection sound in post ASD closure patients signify? Now, normally, there is no ejection sound in patients of ASD who do not have a pulmonary arterial hypertension. So those who do have PAH will have a constant ejection click, which will not vary with respiration. Now, after ASD closure, if on auscultation you do get an ejection sound or a click, it basically points to the formation of chronic changes in the pulmonary artery compliance which in short means that there is pulmonary hypertension, which has not yet regressed despite the closure of the ASD. So a click in an ASD patient denotes pH. Despite closure of ASD, if a click is still there, that means the pH has still not regressed or unfortunately, the pH may still remain and become a fixed type of pH. What are the acoustic characteristics of an ejection sound or a click? So essentially, the ejection sounds are high frequency sounds. They are sharp and discreet and they are equal in intensity to S1. Because they are high frequency, you can best hear them with a diaphragm alone. And the difference, that is the time lag between the first heart sound and the ejection sound which is required in order for a human being to hear them is 50 milliseconds. So there has to be a lag of 50 milliseconds between S1 and ejection sound in order for us to separate the two sounds as two separate entities. Now of the valvular versus non-valvular pulmonary ejection clicks, which one of them is heard more easily? Now, the ejection clicks of valves are heard later in systole than the clicks of the pulmonary root origin. As a result, the valvular clicks are heard better. 
that is because we are able to appreciate them as separate entities from the preceding s1 there is a greater distance from s1 and as a result the valvular origin ejection clicks from the pulmonary side are heard better when you have non valvular pulmonary ejection clicks because of pulmonary hypertension because of the greatly hypertensive pulmonary artery the ejection click is heard very close to the first heart sound and it almost merges with s1 to the extent that we may not be able to separate the two sounds an important point to differentiate pulmonary ejection clicks from the aortic ejection clicks is the area where they are best heard so where is the pulmonary ejection sound or click best heard it is best heard in the second and the third left interspace but it is poorly heard at the apex and remember the aortic ejection click is best heard at the apex so this is how you differentiate both but sometimes when you have a non valvular ejection click on the right side that is because of pulmonary hypertension the clicks can be heard lower down the sternum not necessarily at the apex but at least it goes down towards the sternum down the sternum if the rv is usually dilated which can happen in cases of asd with pulmonary hypertension then the pulmonary ejection click which would then be a non valvular click or a vascular click can also be heard in the mid precordium but the aortic clicks are only heard at the apex and a classic pulmonary ejection click is normally heard in the second and third left interspace now since s1 and ejection clicks occur very close together how do you differentiate s1 from an ejection sound now ejection sounds or clicks vary in intensity with respiration if this ejection sound is coming from a valvular pulmonary stenosis so this is one clue second the s1 is usually soft at the second or third interspace on the left side that is the pulmonary area it is not heard as well as it is heard at the apex so that's another point to differentiate the two sounds now an important question about how do you improve the audibility of the pulmonary ejection sound so the question is in what body habitus is the audibility of this pulmonary ejection sound improved basically you make the person stand up or sit up you assume an upright position as a result there is decrease in the venous return and hence the rv edp of the already low compliant rv becomes lower because you are not going to stress that rv with increased venous return as a result there is less opening of the pulmonary valve cusps at the end of diastole and then in the subsequent systole there is a greater opening excursion of the pulmonary valves so this particular maneuver of standing upright or sitting upright helps in bringing out the pulmonary ejection sound and it can be brought out to an extent that this ejection sound can be heard in both inspiration as well as in expiration now where is the aortic ejection sound best heard we already know that the pulmonary ejection sound is best heard in the pulmonary area and as i have mentioned before the valvular aortic stenosis related ejection sound that is most commonly bicuspid aortic valve related aortic sound that is number 1 and second all cases of aortic stenosis which is seen in people who have chronic lung disease or in the elderly population all of them have their ejection systolic sound which is best heard at the apex can aortic ejection sounds be heard at the base yes in those patients who have a vascular origin of aortic ejection sounds that is those arising from the aortic root the ejection sound is best heard at the base if the aortic root is aneurysmal it in fact will lead to a better hearing of the ejection sound on the right side of the inter intercostal space that is in the second and the third right sided intercostal space does the presence or absence of aortic ejection sound or click have any correlation with the severity 
of aortic stenosis? And the answer is no. What it basically is asking is, does having an ejection sound mean that the AS is severe? That Then the answer is no. The intensity of the sound basically correlates with the pliability of the valve. If an ejection sound is heard, if it's present, that means the valve is pliable. In fact, as the severity of aortic stenosis increases, the ejection click occurs earlier in systole and it can even merge with S1 as I had shown before in the case of pulmonary stenosis. So similarly, even in cases of aortic stenosis, very severe AS will lead to the merging of the aortic click with the S1 and you may in fact not get the ejection sound. So the presence of an ejection sound or click means that the valve the, the bicuspid aortic valve, which is most commonly seen, is pliable. The important question now arises is, does the aortic ejection click vary with respiration like the pulmonary ejection click does? And the answer is no. The only entity which leads to a respiratory variation in the ejection click is the pulmonary valvular ejection click, not even the vascular pulmonary ejection click. So only a valvular pulmonary stenosis will lead to respiratory variation in its click. But why is the aortic ejection click from the aortic valve also not show any respiratory variation? The ejection click even from an aortic stenotic valve or a bicuspid aortic valve is constant. That is because premature opening of the aortic valve will never occur as it occurs on the right side. Just like the pulmonary valve prematurely opens because the right ventricular end diastolic pressure overcomes the pulmonary artery diastolic pressure and tries to push open the pulmonary valve. But this kind of behavior is never seen with the aortic valve. The LVEDP, which is the left-sided equivalent of the RVEDP, the left ventricular end diastolic pressure, never ever rises beyond the aortic diastolic pressure. The left-sided pressures, as we know, are already on the higher side. They are not as low as what is seen on the right side. And so the LVEDP will never rise beyond the aortic diastolic pressure. So it will never lead to a premature opening of the aortic valve. And it will never lead to a subsequent smaller systolic excursion of the aortic valve in the systolic phase. So that behavior is only seen with, on the pulmonary side. And hence, there is no respiratory variation with an aortic ejection click, and it is always constant. Now, when we are trying to differentiate valvular ejection click from a vascular ejection click, we also try to see how the S2 behaves. So the question is, how does S2, that is the second heart sound, differ from differ in cases of valvular ejection click versus vascular ejection click. So suppose you take cases where you get a valvular ejection click. It can either be because of pulmonary stenosis or aortic stenosis. Its, its origin is a valve. So when you have a diminished or a normal S2 or sometimes a widely split S2, you can see that in cases of pulmonary stenosis. The S2 can also be reversed as is seen in aortic stenosis. That is the P2 will come earlier and then A2 will come. Normally, in normal people, A2 comes before P2. But when there is a reversal of the two heart sounds, you can get that in cases of delayed left ventricular events. And over here, when there is a delay of blood flow across a stenosed aortic valve, P2 will come before A2. So this is how the S2 behaves when you have a valvular ejection click. When you have a vascular ejection click because of pulmonary hypertension or systemic hypertension, the S2, the corresponding S2 is usually loud. That is the A2 will be loud or the P2 classically will be loud with pulmonary hypertension. And the split is usually normal or more commonly it is closely split or sometimes it might be so close that it will be a single split. The single split is usually seen with severe pulmonary hypertension. What are causes of pseudo ejection clicks? So what are the sounds which are heard in early systole 
that sound like ejection clicks but really are not. So one of the causes could be delayed and augmented tricuspid closure sound that is T1. Essentially, it represents splitting of the first heart sound that is S1 in which mitral closure sound that is M1 occurs earlier than the delayed tricuspid closure sound. So what could be the causes for this? Number one could be an atrial septal defect in which there's an excessive flow because of the right to left shunt across the interatrial septum. And this excessive flow travels across the tricuspid valve as well. As a result, the tricuspid valve closes much later than its corresponding mitral valve on the left side. The second reason could be an Epstein's anomaly of the tricuspid valve. In Epstein's anomaly, we know that the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve is displaced apically, and the anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve is large and sail like. And this anterior leaflet is responsible for ca causing a delayed closure, and delayed closure leads to a sound which is a T1 sound that may look or so that may sound like an ejection click. Some rarer causes of pseudo-ejection clicks is uh, what is seen in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in which there is early explosive ejection sound, which is quite rare. And another reason which has been postulated is in cases of membranous VSD, where there is a septal aneurysm. And this septal aneurysm is responsible for early systolic sounds. These are, however, pretty rare. So the more common causes of a pseudo-ejection click is a delayed tricuspid closure sound. What is the differential diagnosis of systolic ejection sounds overall? So number one is aortic or pulmonary ejection sound or click, which is what we've talked about in this whole video. The other sounds which can make it sound like an ejection sound is the S4 or S4 S1 complex in which the S4 is mistaken to be the first heart sound and then the S1 is mistaken to be the systolic ejection sound since they are so close together. A split S1 could be another differential as we saw previously in which the mitral sound for example occurs earlier and then the tricuspid closure sound occurs much later and then that can give rise to a systolic ejection sound mistakenly and then there are certain cases of mitral valve prolapse in which the clicks occur much earlier now usually mitral valve prolapse is associated with non ejection clicks it is nothing it does not occur from the beginning of systole it occurs in mid systole and beyond but sometimes these clicks can occur earlier in systole which might be mistakenly taken to be as a ejection systolic sound instead of a non ejection sound so that brings us to the question of how does the click of mitral valve prolapse simulate an ejection click? So as I already told earlier, usually mitral valve prolapse is associated with non-ejection clicks. However, when there is severe mitral valve prolapse, the holosystolic prolapse occurs right from the beginning of systole and it is usually associated with mitral regurgitation. So what happens is the non-ejection click starts moving closer to S1 and it starts sounding like an ejection click and it starts simulating a true ejection click even though it may not be. How do you differentiate pulmonary stenosis from ASD? When you have a patient with a pulmonic outflow murmur along with wide splitting of S2. Now this is an interesting question. We know that in both ASD and pulmonary stenosis, you can get a pulmonic outflow murmur. The reason for a murmur in both these situations is different. In pulmonic stenosis, you get an ejection systolic murmur because of the turbulence of blood going across a diseased pulmonic valve. The reason why you get an, a, an outflow murmur in ASD is because there's excessive blood volume which is flowing across the pulmonary valve, which is normal. The valve is normal, but it has to face an onslaught of excessive blood volume. So regardless, both these situations have a pulmonic outflow murmur, and both these situations also have a wide splitting of the S2. Again, the reason is same is because there is delay in the closure of pulmonary valve in both the situations because there is 
excessive events which are occurring across the pulmonary valve. In pulmonary stenosis, there is delay in closure because there is turbulence and the valve is diseased. And in ASD, because of excessive volume, it takes a longer time for the pulmonary valve to close as compared to its left-sided aortic valve. So both murmur and white splitting of S2 can confuse us and we will not be able to know whether it is pulmonary stenosis or ASD on a clinical examination. Of course, ASD is associated with wide fixed splitting of S2, but this fixed nature may not be sometimes apparent when the murmur is quite harsh and hence you will not be able to differentiate ASD from pulmonary stenosis. So the one sound which helps differentiate PS from ASD is this pulmonary ejection sound or click, which is heard in pulmonary stenosis and is not heard in ASD. The only time when you do hear a pulmonary ejection click in ASD is when it is associated with significant pH. But the click which is associated with pH would be constant and the ejection click seen with pulmonary stenosis would not be constant. It would be a variable click which would be softer in inspiration and louder in expiration. This is an interesting question. Can an ejection sound or a click be heard in cases of coarctation of aorta? And the answer is yes. And there are two causes. Number one is if the coarctation of aorta is associated with a coexisting bicuspid aortic valve. And you have to know it's a part of complex. Whenever you get a bicuspid aortic valve, you have to check the descending thoracic aorta to see if there is any coarctation which might have been missed and vice versa. So if there's a coarctation of aorta, you have to consider the possibility of the existence of a bicuspid aortic valve. And as we know, this bicuspid aortic valve, whether it is stenosed, whether it's regurgitating or by itself alone, it can give rise to an ejection sound. And this is more commonly heard at the apex. And again, this aortic ejection click will be constant. It will not vary with inspiration. The other cause of an ejection sound in cases of aorta, uh, in cases of coarctation of aorta would be aortic dilatation. And that is because of sustained upper body hypertension. As we know, coarctation of aorta is associated with, uh, with hypertension in the upper body and hypotension in the lower parts of the body. And as a result, sustained upper body hypertension can lead to aortic dilatation. Another reason for aortic dilatation could be if there is bicuspid aortic valve, it is associated with aortopathy, wherein again there is dilatation of the aorta. So regardless of the reason, there would be dilatation and it would give rise to again an ejection sound. But this particular ejection sound again would be constant but would be heard better at the base of the heart rather than at the apex. How is the S4-S1 complex identified? Now, the S4-S1 complex is one of the differentials of the S1 ejection click complex. Hence, it's essential to differentiate both of them. Now, what is S4? S4 is the fourth heart sound. It occurs because of a vigorous atrial kick. It could be either because, on, uh, because of the left atrial kick or the right-sided uh, right atrial kick. And the presence of an atrial kick means that the patient has sinus rhythm. So the prerequisites for getting S4 is number one, sinus rhythm. Second, S4 can either be the, a left-sided event, that is, it can be an LVS4 or it can be an RVS4. Now, an LVS4, as it's, an, as it's a left-sided event, increases on expiration. Whereas an RVS4, because it's a right-sided event, increases on inspiration. These are the main concepts of S4. Why does S4 occur? It is associated with left ventricular hypotrophy or left ventricular dilatation. This is for left side and the same goes on the right side. So whenever there is a loss of LV compliance or RV compliance, it leads to S4. What that means is, Loss of compliance means in diastole, the LV or the RV is not able to accept blood easily. It is not able to relax as easily enough in order to accept blood in diastole. So what happens is towards the end of diastole, the left atrium or the right atrium on the right side contracts vigorously 
in order for blood to move with much more ease from the upper atria to the ventricle. So LVH, which occurs in cases of uh, patients who have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or those who have diastolic dysfunction, develop an S4. And LV dilatation occurs when there is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, where it, in which there is LV dysfunction when the ejection fraction is reduced. So either of the two scenarios can give rise to S4. Now, S4 is best heard with a, with a bell and it is not heard at the, at the base of the heart. So that means that S4 is heard best at the apex with the bell. On the other hand, the ejection sound, if it is pulmonary, is heard best at the base of the heart. The only exception is an aortic ejection sound, which is also heard at the apex, but it is best heard with the diaphragm of the stethoscope. One of the differentiating factor of S4 is that it waxes and wanes with changes of venous return. If the venous return is increased, that is if the patient, for example, is lying supine from a standing position or if there is leg raising of the patient, then the venous return gets increased and hence there is excessive blood volume, say, on the right, left side of the heart or even right side of the heart. It depends on which S4 we are talking about. So when there is excessive venous return, the corresponding atria has to contract more vigorously and so the S4 becomes louder and opposite changes occur when the venous return is decreased. Now remember as I al already told that the RV S4 that is a right-sided S4 increases with inspiration since it's a right-sided event but the exception is that the ejection sound which is the right-sided ejection sound or the pulmonary ejection sound increases with expiration this is the only exception to the rule and this is how you differentiate a right-sided s4 from a right-sided eje pulmonary ejection click how is a split s1 identified now this is another differential of the s1 ejection click complex so we have to differentiate it from an ejection click now, split S1 is heard when there is a difference between M1 and T1. Usually, both M1, which is mitral valve closure sound, and T1, which is tricuspid valve closure sound, occur so close to each other that we think that, is, that it is just one single sound, which is S1. But some certain reasons lead to the splitting of S1. Now, S1 is not heard well at the base. This is in contrast to the ejection click, which is heard well at the base, especially a uh, ejection click because of pulmonary valve ejection click or an ejection click because of an aortic root ejection click. The only difference is, the only exception is an aortic valve ejection click, which is heard best at the apex. So overall, S1 sound is heard best at the apex. And there is poor radiation of both these sounds, which is the both, both the components of these sounds away from the apex. Split S1 or S1 overall is best heard with the diaphragm. Now, ejection click is also best heard with the diaphragm. So the only way you can differentiate a split S1 from an ejection click is that it is not heard well at the base, the split S1, whereas it is best heard at the apex. So this is an interesting thing to ponder. What are the clues to the presence of a bicuspid aortic valve on clinical examination? Now, sometimes it can be extremely rewarding to have a good clinical examination and to sus strongly suspect the presence of a bicuspid aortic valve and then to have it confirmed on an echocardiogram. That is one of the best times. So what are the clues? A loud systolic sound, which is heard both at the base and apex, but it is louder at the base than at the apex. And it sounds as if there is a split S1, which is widely audible. That should make you suspect to the presence of a bicuspid aortic valve. Remember, sometimes bicuspid aortic valve can give rise to an ejection systolic sound, which is heard purely at the apex. That's what I've spoken about. But in younger children, uh, this ejection sound can be heard both at the base as well as the apex and it may even sound louder at the base so it almost makes you feel as if there is a split S1 which is widely radiated.
and we know that a normal split S1 is not widely radiated. It prefers to only remain at the apex. But if you find this sound, which is there throughout, both at the base and the apex, in a young child, and it may or may not be associated with an early diastolic murmur, which is heard either at the apex or the lower sternal border. What does the presence of this early diastolic murmur point to? It points to the presence of an aortic regurgitation. So usually a bicuspid aortic valve can give rise to aortic stenosis in two of the following age groups. Either it will come in early infancy or in the neonatal period with a very severely stenotic bicuspid aortic valve stenosis, which, which, which will lead to uh, early interventions. or a bicuspid aortic valve can lead to aortic stenosis in, in latter part of adulthood, in the middle ages, because there is slow degeneration of that bicuspid aortic valve. But in a seemingly normal child, say a 10-year-old child, who has this widely audible split S1, you do not expect a stenotic murmur to be heard. And more often than not, you'll hear an aortic regurgitation murmur, which, which comes as an early diastolic murmur, which may be soft, but it may be picked up in a, in a child because of a thinner chest wall. So this particular combination of a loud systolic sound, which sounds like a split S1, but it is really not a split S1, along with this AR murmur should, should perk your antenna to the possibility of a bicuspid aortic valve. So let's summarize all that we have learned today because it's always good to have a mental picture of all the data that you've just gone through right now. So this is just a short overview so that you'll be able to elaborate it further as you think about it. So ejection sounds or clicks are divided into pulmonary ejection sounds and aortic ejection sounds. Each of them are divided into valvar ejection sounds and vascular ejection sounds, valvar and vascular. The pulmonary valvar ejection sound is heard best at the base of the heart in the pulmonary area, and it is the only ejection click or sound which demonstrates respiratory variation. So it's a variable sound or, an, or a variable click. All the others are constant. That, that is, they do not show any variation with respiration. The vascular ejection click from the pulmonary area is heard at the base. The valvar ejection click from the aortic area, that is from the aortic valve, is heard best at the apex. And the ejection click heard from the aortic root, which is the vascular aortic ejection click, is again heard at the base. The differentials of these ejection sounds is split S1, the S4-S1 complex, and the early mitral valve pro prolapse clicks, which are Commonly clicks which generate non-ejection sounds. They are non-ejection clicks, but if they occur too early, they can be mistaken to be early ejection sounds. So this is an overview. So what next? Now go through the list of questions for active recall that I've given at the beginning of this video, because active recall is the key to any learning. It is the key for proper understanding of concepts. So questioning yourself, going through the questions and trying to answer them as much as possible and then checking the answers is the only way that you will actually learn something and the only way that you'll remember it forever, not just remember it for an exam, regurgitate it and then promptly forget about it. We don't want to do that. We want to try and remember it so that you can always apply this knowledge when you actually see a clinical patient. And of course, like, share, subscribe, comment, Press the bell icon, the usual, till we see you the next time. Bye.